name is Chef Josh Franca. I am the owner and operator of Gastronomy Live Events in South Texas. We are a culinary activation company, and what that means is that I actually uh, teach my clients about their food systems. Uh, grew up fishing and hunting all over, uh, all over the nation, but the bedrock, my bedrock of hunting is down in South Texas. Uh, we, we hunt mostly uh, whitetail. Uh, we also hunt a good amount of fowl that come through. Uh, if we go to North Texas, Sandhill Crane is a lot of what we do, right? And then uh, a lot of hog. I grew up hunting hog. And so uh, also being from a German heritage, we did a lot of whole animal cooking and a lot of processing on the other side. I know I asked this earlier, who here processes their, their, their own harvest? Really, I love it, fantastic. So what we are going to use today and which I'm really excited about is Neil Guy. So Neil Guy is in the antelope family. If you're just now joining us, its shoulders are right about here. Its head is another three feet up. Google it, it's insane. So a little bit about the anatomy of each, each one of our animals. Everything that you're going to process, as long as it's around the same genus species, is actually going to have the same anatomy, right? And you're going to, if everybody can see that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna see that these different areas lend themselves to different muscle structures and different ligaments, right? And so anything coming off the, the rump or anything coming off of the back, especially the tenderloin, tenderloin is the best part, right? Or your, your back strap. The tenderloin and the back strap of the animal do very, very little. It actually helps it move back and forth, but as far as running away from predators or dodging your shot because you just need to take one of our precision courses or whatever, that was a joke. Ha <laughs> sympathy laughs, I love it. So that, that muscle structure really doesn't do a lot for the animal except kind of stabilize it. But once we start moving away and we get closer to the legs and the shanks, you know that those areas are actually full of ligamentation, right? They're full of a lot of connective tissue. And that connective tissue takes a long while to actually break down and cook. If you've had good ribs, if you've been down in South Texas, and you've had brisket, the reason why we love brisket is because the cooking of that connectivity, or that, that connective tissue rather, will actually start giving you that extra mouthfeel that everybody loves, right? It just takes a while to get there. You're not gonna cook a backstrap the way you are a brisket. You just can't, okay? So, so with, with the different cuts that, that we actually have here, each one of them can, can lend itself to different cooking practices as well. Let's go on to the next slide. So you, you, have lean, you have lean tissue, right? You have high connective tissue, and then you actually have super fatty tissue. We love the fatty tissue, right? Because what ends up happening is, is we know darn well that fat equals flavor. And that's why my wife thinks I'm so delicious and wonderful, right? Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm here all day, literally. I'm not going anywhere. So with these different areas, you have to cook these in different ways. You can't, again, cook, you can't cook a shank the same way that you'll cook a backstrap. It just won't work, okay? So the connective muscle, muscle tissue is actually with these strands of connective tissue. Each one of those connective tissues need to be cooked down into gelatin in order to make them actually viable and ready to eat, right? Silver skin is your only exception. Silver skin is the thing that keeps popping up in every single time you start to, to, to trim any, any animal, right? Um, and the silver skin is the hardest ligament that actually causes the animal to, to move a lot quicker, okay? Fatty tissue, we love the fatty tissue, but again, it takes, it takes a certain type of cooking in order to render out that fat. Um, one of the courses we're gonna do at 1.30 is actually called Fat Equals Flavor, and we're actually gonna break down the steps it takes in order to render out that, that fat in the right way. If you don't render it out in the right way, you're gonna get food that's gristly, right? You're gonna get food that doesn't break down easily. Um, and then what you will find is that if you render it out too much, you lose a lot of that fat within the animal. Lean tissue, it makes up the majority of everything that, that, that we actually cut up. So every time I do one of these courses, I always break down everything into hardware and software, right? Your hardware is gonna be everything you need to facilitate the recipe, meaning a good cutting board, a really sharp knife, you know? Um, even comfortable shoes are, are something that we talk about. But then a good bus tub, these totes are really inexpensive. Go to any um, out, outdoor supply, they'll, they'll have them for six or seven bucks about nine or 10 after inflation, sorry. Okay, clean work surface. You're dealing, yeah, right? You're, you're, you're dealing with uh, animal protein. We consider this a potentially hazardous food. It needs to be kept cold. It needs to be kept actually under 40 degrees, 
okay? So that 40 degrees will help not spread the path, uh, will not help spread pathogens. That's something we need to focus on every step of the way. This right here, sitting on ice. I don't, I don't take any other, you know, I, I, I don't play around with this, right? Sharp knife. So, what you want is a deboning knife. You want one that has dexterity, that can bend around bones and do everything, everything you need it to do. I'm gonna ask one question. I need everybody to be honest here. This is, the, uh, this is the, the box of truth, okay, and the box of safety. Who here puts their knives in the dishwasher? No? <laughs> Y'all can leave. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please don't leave. Um, knives don't go in the dishwasher. Uh, knives in the dishwasher. What it does is it causes the, the, the blade to warp. And what we want is a very straight or true blade. We want one with as little curvature in it, not this way, but curvature as in back and forth as possible. And putting this in the dishwasher, not great, okay? I will drive to wherever you're at and I will unplug your dishwasher, okay? <laughs> so another thing, cutting boards. For something like this, a polyurethane cutting board is, is perfect for it. It's nice and wide. It gives me a lot of surface area. You can get one that's two and three times the size. The reason why I like these for, for game cooking is that they're not permeable. If I start cutting on a bamboo cutting board, every time I cut down, I'm actually leaving a scar. Pathogens. Bacteria, they love that. So this is a lot harder to clean than this. This will accept the blade and not dull it as much, okay? And then, um, yeah, and then your, your bus tubs, I always, I always have one or two of these. Um, I think it's, it's crucial to have a bus tub that's good for trim as you're trimming the fat, as you're doing everything else. We call this mise en place in French, right? Mise en place essentially means everything in its place. So every time you look around, you have everything ready to go and you're not having to go, I gotta stop what I'm doing and go back outside and go to the barn and get whatever I need. Everything is accessible, everything's within arm's reach, okay? Let's go to the next. Prime example of mise en place. Protein, so we're gonna start, I'm gonna make real quick work of this. We're gonna, this is actually the, if you're just now joining us, this is the leg or the ham of an, of a, an antelope called a Texas antelope or a Neil guy. Again, this big at the shoulder, that's how tall he is. So you can Google that. Alrighty, you ready to start cutting up some Neil guy? Yeah. So what we have is obviously the ham portion. This is actually from Texas. I'm going to take this out. Um, this is not actually not too far from FTW Ranch. I see that you're wearing the shirt. I appreciate that. Oh, that's right. I knew you looked familiar. Fantastic. Okay. So as you can see, we have, we have the ham. And so they've, they've actually cut it off at the femur. And so inside here, we know that in, uh, hidden beneath all of, this, uh, all of this fat and all of this protein is gonna be, is gonna be the knee muscle structure, or that's gonna be the hip rather. So um, the hip bone, a part of the hip bone is right back here. So the one thing, and my girls know this, is the uh, tip of knife next to bone, right? And this is one thing that we constantly talk about whenever we're, we're butchering. What I mean by that is when you are actually cutting down and you're getting into the muscle fibers, the moment that you touch that bone, use that bone as a guide, right? Scrape the bone up against the knife. This requires a very, very sharp knife. You're not playing around with your, your you know, Walmart 1099 knife. You gotta get one that's good. I suggest not getting one with a celebrity's name on it. They dull really easy. Sorry, that's just the way that it is. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll notice where the bone is, and what I'm gonna do is what's called seam butchering, and this is gonna go pretty quick. So every one of these muscles are going in a different direction, right? So it's, um, what I mean by that is, is the grain. So if you look right here, this grain is going this way. The muscles behind it that are, that are separated by ligaments are going in an opposite direction. If you do what is called seam butchering, what you're doing is, is you're actually taking out those muscle groups and you're relieving the, uh, the, the top sirloin, the eye of the round, all that is within this area, right? So what I will do is I'll find a seam and you can notice that one's right there. Can you all get a good look right there? So what I'll do is I'll notice that there's a seam right there and I'll make really really precise cuts, and then I'm always going back down to that bone. I wanna find, find that bone and I wanna get down to it so that I can use that bone as a guide. The good thing is, is that this is still slightly frozen. 
Slightly frozen protein is phenomenal for cutting. You're going to get cleaner cuts out of it, especially if you have a sharper knife. But you're also going to, uh, if you go straight to grinding, right, a, a really good protein, nice and cold, is going to give you a really solid grind. So then, right here, can you all hear that? So right there's our bone. And what we're going to do is I'm actually going to use that again as a guide and then travel back down. I have this large muscle group that's right here. This is what I want to free up. The reason being is that I can see that the muscle structure goes in one direction. If I take this, I can use this for stir fry. I can use this for really anything, anything that I need, knowing where the muscle structure is. Even taking it and using it as a roast would, would be a, a great option, OK? So then I'm going to turn it towards you all. And I'm going to use that, oh, I lost the bone. I'm going to use that bone as a guide. And I'm going to start freeing up this entire muscle group right here. Tip of knife next to what? What is it? Bone. Fantastic. Y'all are perfect. Y'all did get some coffee. That's awesome. So once I get down to that muscle group, I'll start freeing up that against the bone. And sorry for me going pretty quick here, but hi, y'all. How are y'all? And you can tell by the protein, nice and clean. While we're doing this, the entire time that we're actually working on this animal, we're looking at the quality of the protein, right? Especially if you, more importantly, if you harvested it yourself. You wouldn't have pulled the trigger or let go of that, of that uh, arrow unless you did all of your due diligence to make sure that that is actually in good shape, right? So I'm going to free up that area. And so I have that bone structure right up against it. Every time I run this knife, I'm running it against the bone and working to snag up all of that. Any questions so far? No? Yes. So what I know is that there's two in here, because I can look right here. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. So uh, that was a great question. So we, we, we know that, that there's two different muscle structures, one going in one direction, one going the other. I know just by this that if I take out the segment, I can then separate it, and I can actually separate it right here through this pocket. Just because it's slightly, it's just a slight bit still frozen, what we want to do, and this, this is good. This is, this is a good thing for what we want. What we're looking at is, is using that seam right there to do exactly what we need to, to take it apart. So once I get down, and I'm really only, just for right now, I'm really going to only free up this because I think the important part to remember during this course is to focus on your grain, right? Which way, which way your grain is going, but also your different ligaments. Like how are you going to take those apart? The next course that we do is actually going to be next level butchering. So I'll teach you trussing. I'll actually teach you how to actually get this ready for a roast, how to get it ready for a braise. It really any number, any number of things. Any other questions? Yes. So, so I, I love to dry age, right? Um, or I'll, curing is a whole different thing on, on Saturday. We'll actually have a curing course. But, but letting it age and letting nature kind of do its job to start breaking apart all the enzyme and all the muscle structure that's in there is, is really the best, best thing. Um, without it, uh, you, you can eat it fresh. It'd be, it tastes fantastic. But things start to change their molecular structure once you start getting into really aging and, and, and breaking each, each one of those uh, components down, right? But uh, a lot of people will um, take it, and they will actually let nature do its job if they have, if they have a barn or they have something outside that they can take that... Um, they can take that, that entire muscle structure or, or the, um, really a primal of the animal and just as easily just hang it outside. Um, a lot of, place, a lot of uh, principalities like your, your, food, your, your food handlers and all those other things will, will um, kind of look down on that because it doesn't necessarily, it has, it has a, there's a higher probability that you're inviting pathogens, but you want the good pathogens in and the bad pathogens out. So it needs to be, it needs to be 55 degrees. That's the best for fermentation. Fermentation of, of, of anything would be great. So just so we're going to wrap up this one course, what you will see is now that we have this connective tissue, this right here will take, um, it'll take a few hours to cook down, right? 
Um, but really, it doesn't lend itself to any flavor. I don't want to add anything that doesn't actually add flavor or texture. But I'm also very careful not to waste a single bit of this animal. Even the bones we're going to roast and we're going to use, we're going to put it in our pizza oven and we're going to roast them and make a brown stock for tomorrow. So feel free to check out our, yeah, no, check, check out our class on that. But here's our culprit right here. And this is kind of in closing. Our culprit is the silver skin. We talked about this earlier. This silver skin lends absolutely nothing to flavor or texture. What we want to do is get as much of that out as possible, okay? And it's, it's really quite simple. On a back strap, you can fillet it just like you're doing a fish, right? You would take one side, turn your, you guys already know, you're already ahead of me. This is why you're front row, VIP access over here. So then I'm gonna take the knife and actually turn it up. This only happens with a sharp knife. I can even take some of this and take that off and use that, if y'all can see that. I'll use, I, I don't wanna, I wanna waste as little as possible. So this right here would be perfect for my grind. I'll take this and throw it right into my grind. And now that I have this muscle group and I've taken that silver skin off, a little haphazardly, but we'll get there. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Y'all are my favorite class so far. See what I did there? <laughs> okay, so. I'll go back and trim this here in a little bit. Everything stays on ice. If I'm not using it, I, I, I teach uh, young, young students a lot, and you'll see that they put their, their keys and their phone on their cutting board, and I'm like, what are you doing? Everything that's here is the real estate should be everything that's in your head. That's the only thing you're focusing on. So now, this right here, this would actually be a part of the top sirloin. What I can do is you can see the muscle structure goes in this direction. If I cut against that, I have sirloin steaks. Perfect for the grill. Right? A lot of people think that the back part of the animal or the ham or any of those other parts don't, don't lend themselves to, to grilling and that really fast cooking. I'm here to tell you that it is. So you can actually go through and cut those like that, but what would be awesome with this is slow roast. You can put this in the, in the smoker. You can just let it go until it starts to fall apart. And then um, something we're gonna do with it actually is uh, for our next course tomorrow, I'm gonna teach you how to trust this and how to go through and get it ready for a really good braise. Anybody here do any braising at home? Yeah, anybody here not know what braising is? No, good, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs>